All right, this morning we're going to start looking at starting systems, and I have in my hands here uh, a permanent magnet starter, which is a lot smaller than the electromagnet starters. This one happens to be a more modern vehicle, and so is that one on the screen there. Here's a, by comparison, here's an electromagnet starter, much larger, and here's the permanent magnet starter from a Honda Odyssey. The gear, the way the gear comes out is a little bit different, but there's the electromagnet starter, much heavier much less expensive, and so on. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, first talking about a starting system. And as you look on the screen here, you can notice we have a regular lead-acid DC battery, positive cable going down to the solenoid sol sol connection. That's a pretty standard uh, way of connecting a starter, going right to this terminal right here on the starter solenoid. It's piggyback on the starter as well. Uh, what we have is the ground side going from the negative battery cable, usually onto the case or down on the block or the transmission bell housing area, but in either case, uh, that's our ground. On the back to the positive side, so here's our starter solenoid. That's a basically it's a high current relay, if you will, that does two things. It relays high current into the starter motor, um, and it also has a mechanism, a linkage to go ahead and engage that gear. So what we'll do is first is I'll show you that in one moment. So I can show that to you here by holding this up. And this plunger is what's getting, being pulled over by the solenoid to pull the gear out and to engage it uh, with the flywheel ring gear. So what we're gonna look at next here, or one other thing I want you to see here, sorry, is that You've got power coming off and going to a starter relay, which is kept under control by a neutral safety switch and the ignition switch. So this ignition switch sends power through the relay. And without that neutral safety switch, either being in park or neutral, we won't send power through to the starter solenoid. Um, in any case, when we engage the relay, we're going to send power down to a terminal here. That's going to activate the starter solenoid. And then the high cor current portion allows high current to go into the starter and actually spin the starter. So our general function for a starting system goes like this. We want that starter motor gear to rapidly snap out and spin the um, flywheel ring gear with no grinding or screeching. I have here in my hands an automatic transmission uh, ring gear and we call it a flex plate. This is the actual ring gear portion you can see that this has actually been uh, welded on. So the ring gear gets welded to that flex plate. So this is for an automatic transmission. The manual transmission one, right, be, right behind me here, much heavier because we use it as an inertial wheel to keep energy in motion. Helps us with torque. But once again, there's the flywheel ring gear. This one's just pressed on. These are not welded on. Um, we can actually beat them off with a chisel and then heat them up with a torch and drop them back on. Sometimes in, back in the day when one side of the teeth would get chipped, we would go ahead and um, take it off and flip it around and we would be able to have a clean side for the starter gear to contact. So we want that starter motor to initiate that four-stroke cycle of the engine. So it gets that um, starter spinning, so we get the intake, compression, power, exhaust, four-stroke cycle going. Um, also, we, of course, want it to start the car quickly without draining the battery. So we don't want um, it to crank long. Um, a long crank condition uh, typically is not a starting issue. Typically, a long crank condition is a byproduct of spark plugs that are worn or air filter that's dirty or something like that. But we do want it to start quickly, etc. And uh, immediately so that we're not overtaxing the battery and we're not uh, overtaxing the starter motor. So let's talk about starting system components. And uh, for for starters, we have automotive pun intended. Um, we have a battery, which is our power source for starting uh, our starter motor operation. So that uh, battery is going to be our basically a 12 volt um, source, uh, our resting fully charged Lead acid battery voltage is supposed to be 12.6 volts or 2.1 volts times six cells. Uh, when we start the car, it's typically going to drop to somewhere between 
10 and a half and 11 and a half volts because it's fairly standard to have about a one and a half to two volt voltage drop when you're actually uh, engaging the starter motor starting the car. We've got an ignition switch gives us uh, system control, whether it be a key type switch, whether it be a push button switch, whether it be a remote switch. We have an ignition switch that's giving us system control to engage the starter. And of course, today we have a one touch start where you turn the key and just let go of it and the uh, engine will automatically crank until it starts. As well as we have start stop technology, which we've talked about before and talk about again where a car stops and shuts off at a stoplight. Um, the computer, the PCM is looking at brake in, uh, pedal input, um, it looks at vehicle speed down at zero, it sees idle speed, and it shuts the car off. And the moment you lift your foot off the brake pedal and touch the gas, it re-engages the starter motor and starts it, unless it's a Mercedes-Benz that remembers which cylinder was on compression um, and it just injects fuel and gives it a spark and spins the crank by that explosion of that one cylinder. Third component of our starting system is a neutral safety switch or a clutch safety switch. So a neutral safety switch here is to keep us from starting in any gear except park or neutral. And a clutch safety switch is a switch that is attached to the clutch so that the car will not start unless the clutch is fully depressed and both is to prevent us from starting in gear, and both are considered uh, safety items in how the, the how the system will function. So, looking further at components, we have a starter relay, and this is a um, uh, this is a starter relay on, that was used on, mostly on Fords, and all starter relays or all relays are a low current control of a high current battery flow. Now. This is a high current relay, meaning it uses low current to turn on high current. So this thing can handle, you know, five or 600 amps uh, from the battery to the starter if need be, even though normal starter current draw is between say 125 and 175 amps, um, that thing, that relay can handle a lot of current. So I've got one here in my hands and you can see it has very, very heavy copper contacts. There's the plunger there. And the idea is that that plunger goes up inside there. You can kind of see how it goes in there. It goes up inside in there. And um, what happens is this unit is a copper coil of wire. When I energize that coil, it centers this plunger in the middle of the magnetism, which pulls this copper disc down onto those two copper contacts that are underneath it. Those are very, very high current copper contacts. Sorry, let me point to them properly. That one there and that one over there. Okay. Those contacts wear, they burn. You can see this one's got a pretty good burn on one side. And on the other side, it's got a little step in it. Let's see if I can get it to focus on there. Maybe not. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. But in any case, that's a high current starter relay uh, as opposed to a low current uh, Bosch style relay, which is here. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have a low current relay. Our ignition switch will send maybe 20 amps and it'll send it down to the starter motor, which in this case is a combination high current relay and a solenoid. The high current portion is connecting battery positive to uh, high current input into the starter motor. Um, the solenoid function is pulling a plunger over and moving a mechanical in linkage to engage that starter pinion gear with the flywheel ring gear. Okay, so that's a Bosch style relay with our parallel, parallel 8586 terminals and our T-shaped terminals uh, 37 and uh, 30 and 87. Uh, that center one's 87A. We don't typically use it, but we can. Uh, this one gets power from the battery when the and relays Disengaged, this one down here gets power from the battery when the relay is engaged. Um, remember the parallel pins are your control circuit, the T pins are your switch circuit, and there's a factory switch connector, okay? Um, so let's go forward on that again. So next we have our solenoid, which I was just mentioning here, which often includes a starter relay or high current relay. And that mechanical solenoid plunger is also going to engage the starter 
drive pinion gear, as I just mentioned. And I'll pause to let you guys catch up. Then sixth, the, the pinion gear engages the flywheel and or flex plate and spins the crankshaft initiating the four stroke cycle as we already uh, mentioned there. All right, so next what we have is we're gonna look at the specific function of the starter. So the specific function of a starter is we have a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field that attempts to center itself. So just envision a permanent magnet with a north and south pole and envision this loop is just a piece of coat hanger, just a rigid piece of wire. One end of the coat hanger is connected to this shell, if you will, shell, contact shell, and the other one's connected to this one. One goes to the positive side of the battery, one goes to the negative side. Now, this is a really simplistic um, explanation and, and diagram of a starter motor. So what happens is when I put current through a conductor in the presence of a magnetic field, it'll try and twist that conductor away from the magnetism. So here's what you have, A and B, these are a cross-sectional view of those two loops. And what happens is when you give that loop current there, the magnetic, sorry, the magnetic lines of force are going to bend under and over, and that's going to cause that loop to twist. So in reality, a starter has... 20 something loops like this. So several of the loops are always trying to spin the armature. So when we talk about those loops, they're constructed in a unit called an armature. An armature consists of a metal shaft that goes all the way through. And then it has these loops and you can see um, the loops start at each one of these commutator bars here. Sorry, I'm not pointing to the commutator. Here's the commutator here. So this loop comes down onto this commentator bar, and then it goes around and around the other side exactly 180 degrees and comes out to a commutator bar on the other side. So it has a brush wearable contact here for positive and here for negative, and all starters have at least two pairs of brushes. So there's always two loops of the starter engaged with current flowing through them to make that magnetic uh, repelling motion that wants to spin that loop. So it says a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field attempts to center itself in the magnetic field. An electromagnet is made of four field coils with battery current passing through them. So here are field coils right here. This is what they look like. So what these are is two magnetic fields. I'm kind of trying to pull them apart a little bit. So this one here and this one opposite are going to be north and south poles. So copper goes, wire goes in there and it's wrapped many, many times around a soft iron pole shoe and goes over to the other one and then goes to ground. So we're going to set up a north-south um, uh, field here. Um, and you can see the brushes there. Or you can see the brush holder. And on this one, the brushes are all worn. I'm going to hold it up real close. So the brushes are in there, but you can see that brush, that spring-loaded contact there, and it's trying to move it, and I am moving it, is worn. So you've got these springs here that are going to exert pressure on the back of the brush. So the brush wants to hit those commutator bars right here on the starter armature. Okay, So that's how we get electricity in and how we get electricity out of that loop to create this uh, current flow in a magnetic field that causes this repelling motion to actually spin the starter. We have permanent magnet starters as well. They can form a field um, by instead of having an electromagnet with a bunch of loops of, of copper around a pole shoe and putting current through that and then current through this, we can have a permanent magnet. And that's what the permanent magnet ones are much, much lighter and consequently better for fuel economy. Um, they are the ones that I showed you first off, the smaller starters that are almost three times as much as the electromagnet starters. So those electromagnet starters were on everything from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and then 
uh, into the 80s. Then the 90s, we started seeing um, smaller permanent magnet starters uh, because as the federal government demands um, higher fuel economy standards, uh, engineers, one of the things they're going to do, of course, is drop the weight of the vehicle. And we have a significant weight reduction on that starter motor going from electromagnet starter to a permanent magnet starter. So let's talk about starter construction. So we have the field coils that are stationary electro slash permanent magnets, which is two pairs of north and south poles. So you can see this inside this case. I'm going to see if I can get the lighting well there. So there's a, um, a, a field coil there. There's one up there. There's one up there, and there's one over here, okay? So you can kind of look in there and see those field coils. I'm trying to get, get my lighting just right here, okay? This one you can see right here where the field coil is wrapped around the inside, but they're on the inside of the case of that starter motor. Um, next is our armature, which we already showed you that is the loops of those wire that's a current carrying conductor and what i didn't tell you before i showed you that this is the shaft here and here here's the loops of wire going through the commutator but then we have a drive mechanism a bendix drive mechanism that's going to come out and move on the helix so it's going to twist and help that pinion gear right there to engage with the flywheel ring gear and then of course there's bushings or bearings out here on the starter to support that and keep it spinning. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about here on starter motors is the brushes. And the brushes, as you can see in the picture, are um, the ends. Essentially, these are the ends of the loops of wire on that armature. So the armature here has a loop of wire that goes from one of these commutator bars all the way around to the other side of the commutator bar, 180 degrees. So this bar right here connects to this bar down here. The brushes wear here and here, so they are bringing in battery voltage, a current flow, into the loop of wire, and then going out to ground on the other side. Now, these two brushes are popped out. There is a spring in here, and they're spring-loaded against the commutator, so essentially this guy sits you know, right up in there like that, um, and those brushes contact it. So there are two pairs of... of um, current carrying uh, <laughs> brushes, sorry, that contact on the um, commutator bars of the armature, okay? They are wearable, and we will replace them when we rebuild the starter. Next is the commutator itself. The commutator are those copper bars on the end of the armature. Again, we'll show them to you right here, okay? And you can see them right here. You can see them right there. So your brushes, again, one's going to contact here, and on the other side, 100 degrees opposite, another one's going to contact. And we're, I've never seen anything less than two pairs of brushes. I have seen three pairs. And so that means that two loops of wire are going to be energized to spin at any given time, unless we have three, and then there's, then there's three as well. So when we um, replace the brushes, we always sand the commutator so that we get a good connection between those brushes and those bars, which are the ends of the loops of wire, okay? And again, it's the current flowing through that wire and the oppositional force of, of magnetism that makes that armature spin. Fifth is bearings and bushings. So on the end of the armature, we're either going to have a brass bushing right, and on the end over here, or we'll have a couple of uh, cage roller bearings to keep that armature centered in the field coils and spinning and again those are going to be wearing and replaceable parts on some cars all right so uh sixth is our drive mechanism so like it says the drive mechanism is going to engage this drive pinion and we can call it drive pinion gear with the flywheel it's very small it's about a, a 1 40th the sides of the flywheel so we've got about a 40 to 1 ratio between this flywheel and this drive pinion gear it's going to retract this pinion when we start up using what's called an overrunning clutch mechanism. And the purpose for that is we don't want to keep this gear engaged with the flywheel and spin it. If we're idling at 1,000 RPM, spin that starter at 40,000 RPM because it's got a 40 to 1 ratio. So this drive mechanism says often includes gear reduction for increased torque. 
So in other words, there's some gear set up on old school Chryslers, etc., and some modern cars so that the starter armature doesn't have to spin quite so fast in order to get this to spin the uh, flywheel, okay? Um, so, in, in fact, uh, I should say that differently. This, I believe, will spin slower than the armature, yes. Spin slower than the armature, but give us more torque so we can get the engine uh, starting that uh, four-stroke intake compression power exhaust four-stroke cycle. So this is our drive mechanism. These do go bad, and we'll talk about in a moment how they malfunction, okay? So next is we want to look at starting system diagnosis. Starting system diagnosis. So what we're going to look at first is several scenarios that we're going to encounter that we're going to have to diagnose. So the first one goes like this. We turn the key, and we get nothing. There's no lights on the dash, no dash warning icons. There's no noise, no nothing. Well, we're assuming that we have a dead battery, okay? We're assuming that the battery is completely discharged. It could be that our cable connections are completely corroded so that there's no current flow at all, but 99% of the time we got a dead battery for whatever reason. So we can go do our battery service and testing. We can make sure it's got water in it, make sure that the electrolyte is clean. Um, we can go ahead and make sure the cables are clean. We could do a load test if we thought that we needed to, but in any case, we've got to deal with the battery, okay? That's our first scenario. We turn the key, we get nothing. Here's our second scenario. We turn the key to crank the car, and we get one click or a rapid clicking. And I'm going to grab a starter right now and show you what this is, sounds like. So here's a starter motor, and I've taken the solenoid off. And so the one click goes like this. It's like that, or the rapid click. Okay, now when it's in the car, in my opinion, it sounds, um, it actually sounds a little lighter and higher pitched, if you will. No, it doesn't sound dense or deep. It sounds like click or click. Okay, so that's what's happening. So the solenoid, which has a pull-in coil and a hold-in coil, when you energize that solenoid, it's trying to center this plunger in the center of that magnetic field of that coil, pulls it over. So when it pulls it, it simultaneously pulls the plunger over and pulls, sorry, and pulls the gear tooth out to engage the gear right here on the on the pinion with the flywheel. What's also happening is this end is hitting the plunger in the high current relay contacts, and that's actually connecting an electrical connection. So this one click or rapid clicking of the um, starter drive pinion is caused almost always by a weak battery. It could be um, bad battery con connections as well, but think service the battery and make sure the battery is in good shape. It can also be a bad solenoid or solenoid contacts. So the solenoid has a pull-in coil and a hold-in coil. The pull-in coil can be working, but the hold-in coil could be bad. That's not very common. The contacts in the starter solenoid, that's a very common thing that can cause that one click or rapid clicking where it's just not getting a good contact, but it's like 95% of the time a weak battery. Can it be the starter itself? For example, the brush contacts on the armature. Yes, because the power will go through the solenoid contacts and then down to the brushes through the field coils. So sometimes the brush contacts can be in such a case that you at least get a one click. You usually won't hear the rapid clicking. The rapid clicking is almost always a weak battery or bad solenoid hold-in coil. Um, but just, again, go for the battery. That's 99% of the time where you're at. Let's go to the next slide here. So the next scenario is, wow, look at that crazy effect. That's kind of cool. Okay, let me get this thing to focus. There it goes. Okay, so the car barely cranks or is slow cranking. Again, could be a weak battery, so we're going to look there first. It barely cranks. It's like, whoa, 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 you know, that kind of thing or slow cranking, like, whoa, whoa, something like that. No, normally, it's a bad battery uh, that's weak. It could be a battery, a bad starter, a starter that has high current draw. So the field coils over time will short together, and they have less resistance. So we make less magnetism, so we have less spinning power. It can be overly advanced ignition time. We think of old school American cars where we had a distributor where we could advance the timing or retard the timing. If we've got it set, you know, at idle at 20 degrees, it's going to go, whoa, 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 and it's going to start. That's a, uh, a, a pretty common 
a situation where we have overly advanced ignition time. We can have a mechanical problem, meaning we can have uh, rod bearings that are spun, um, some kind of mechanical load. We can have a starter motor where the bushings are worn and the armatures leaning over and touching the, the field coil pole shoes. That's what the field coils are wrapped around. Uh, it's an iron pole shoe, and that makes high mechanical load in the starter and high current draw. So D is the engine cranks and it makes loud noises, screeching. This is more of an old school car thing, but this screeching can be caused by the starter being too close to the flywheel. The starter being too close to the flywheel. So we'll start the car, it goes Zroop! something like that, Zroop! or chirp like that. And they do make starter shims that will move the starter motor away from the flywheel. And um, when we do that, that'll take care of that noise. So grinding, which can be caused by a damaged ring gear or just somebody who's got the stereo too loud, they don't know the car is running, they don't have a tack or they don't pay attention to the tack. The car is running and they try to start it and that pinion gear comes out and clashes with the ring gear on either the flex plate or flywheel. So here's an O2 Tacoma where this had happened a bunch and you can see there's teeth missing and there's all kinds of chunks on this. Look at that gear. That's called the ring gear. Look at how bad that thing is worn. If you look at around there, that's because the person who drove this car kept starting the, the car and cranking it when it was already running. Now, modern cars, roughly 07, 08, depending on the car, and newer, we don't allow that to, to happen anymore. What happens is when you go to start the car with a key or push the button, the computer says, hey, the crankshaft position sensor tells me the engine's idling at seven or 800 I, uh, RPM. I'm not going to engage the starter motor, even though you want me to. So we have an 08 Ford Edge here, and if it's running and you try and start it, it will not engage the starter. So you can't run that starter pinning gear into that flex plate or flywheel ring gear anymore. Okay. So sometimes when you've had one where it's been ground and you know, you've ground the uh, starter motor gear into the flywheel. You start the car, you'll get a chirp or some sort of a ringing noise. I've seen that happen before. Okay, E, um, no crank, but the starter spins. Okay, so this is where the drive mechanism is bad in the starter, and it's just, it's spinning. The, the starter motor is spinning, but the gear is not being pushed out and engaging the flywheel, so it just goes, wing, wing, something like that. So you have a defective drive mechanism. We, we, can, we can actually replace that drive mechanism on starters. It used to be a common thing. It's not very common anymore. But um, that is something that can be done to uh, address that, that issue. Let's keep going. So we're going to start talking about starting system testing. And the first and obvious thing we're going to do when we do starting system testing is to test the battery, okay, the battery. So we're going to make sure it's full of electrolyte, like you guys know, this is kind of auto one stuff. We're going to make sure the connections are clean, both the terminals and the cable connections. We're going to make sure it's resting voltage is sitting around 12.6 volts, uh, no load resting voltage. And we can also perform a load test to make sure that the battery is in good shape. I want to remind you that the battery, we can look at the date code, and if we're close to seven years, we know the battery's pretty much done. I have never seen a battery last more than seven years, except in maybe like one instance. So it's pretty rare that a battery will last more than seven years. So if it's getting close to seven years, you can be pretty sure that, that um, it's, it's about time to uh, replace it. And if you do a load test, it's probably going to fail the load test. But if it's a small four-cylinder engine and it's starting fine and you want to save the money and get every bit out of it that you can, I have more power to you. I think it's a good idea. Secondly, in our starting system testing, we're going to do a crank signal test, okay? A crank signal test. This is where we're going to take a, a test light, and I'm going to show you this in the, in the actual hands-on portion. It's going to be right after this. We're going to take a test light, and we're going to put it down at the starter where we have the starter crank signal terminal. So let me grab a starter here, and I'll show you. So I have a part of a starter here, and this little male spade connector is where our wire comes on attaches if i put my if it's plugged in and i put my test light here and i engage the 
key, this thing better light up. If it doesn't light up, the reason why we have a no start condition is because something's wrong upstream. Something's wrong with the neutral safety switch or the ignition switch or the wiring or the alarm. If I get power here when I turn the key to the crank position, but the starter doesn't work, I, I know the problem's in the starter motor. Okay. So we're going to verify that the ignition switch controlling power to the starter solenoid, that it's doing it. So the ignition switch is actually activating power at the starter solenoid. You'll see that in the demonstration. Next, next is we can look at the ignition circuit and the solenoid bypass circuit on an old school car. But we're just going to verify that the starter functions without the ignition switch and the starter uh, solenoid. So, meaning what we can do here is we can bypass the ignition circuit and just make sure the starter functions, okay? So in other words, if I check, do my crank signal test and I don't, and I get a crank signal, then, or, or I don't get a crank, whatever, I can actually check the starter by bypassing, you know, check it uh, on my own. I can self power it, um, or I can take it out of the car and test it. Um, fourth, I can do a starter current draw test and I should. And what we're looking for is how much current, assuming that the car is cranking now. So this is obviously a no crank situation. This is obviously a no crank situation, but we have a, we have a positive signal test, meaning we got a, a test light lights up at that signal wire, and we want to verify the starter condition. But if it cranks, but it's not cranking properly, um, it doesn't crank fast enough to start it properly, we're going to do a starter current draw test. And we want to make sure there's no excessive current, usually under 150 amps, and that we're able to maintain a voltage about 9.5 six volts and we have normal cranking speed so uh, we'll do a start current draw test um, when i record the sound of an engine cranking sometimes a little hard to hear how hard it's cranking with the microphone in the camera but we'll work on that so next we have a starter cranking voltage test we can just put a voltmeter and just look at the voltage drop in the starting system we really want it to be 10 and a half to 11 and a half volts it's a quick test to just see um, that things are working right, but but really that starter current draw test and the battery testing is, is really going to tell us everything we know, so this in some ways is a little superfluous. But finally, we can do a starter free running current draw test where let's say we we have a the car fails the starter current draw test and we think we have a bad starter, we pull the starter out and if we have a current draw tester like we do, we can do it free running where it's not turning the engine over. We can measure the amperage drawn by the starter and see how well it does. And like it says here, this is performed out of the car on a tester. And usually about 75 amps is normal with normal speed, 75, 80 amps. And this just tells us the starter is good or bad. And I'm going to do a starter current draw test and show you one that I have that runs about 130 amps. And it did crank the car, but it cranked it slow. Um, so we'll do a starter free running current draw test upstairs on our tester. Um, and then we can also do what we call starter ground circuit and insulated circuit, which is the hot side of the system, uh, voltage drop testing. So what this is going to do is we're going to go looking for a bad connection, something that's got resistance, that's resisting current flow, that's causing a voltage drop, and so the system isn't working properly. So a, a tenth of a volt per connection voltage drop is acceptable, although we'd love to see it lower. Two-tenths um, is acceptable on the ground circuit of a starter because we have two connections. On the insulated or hot side, four-tenths is acceptable due to two connections on the positive cable and two connections on the solenoid connection on the cable, or not cable, but the disc, okay? Total circuit voltage drop of six-tenths or less is acceptable. And I'm going to show you how we'll just go to the battery. We'll put the, the voltmeter on positive and negative. We'll crank the car after disabling the fuel system. And we'll see it drop maybe to 11 volts. So we would say, ah, we got about a 1.6 volt total voltage drop. Um, okay, and so uh, 6 tenths is acceptable. Now you say, well, hey, Mr. L, you say 6 tenths is acceptable, and we've got a 1.6 across. Okay, well, all we did was we tested the positive and negative connections. We didn't look at the voltage drop through the windings of the armature and through the field coil windings and through the starter um, commutator brushes. So that's all going to add more voltage drop. So six tenths 
on our starter um, ground and insulated circuit voltage drop, but a total of about a volt and a half to two volts total starting system voltage drop is acceptable. So obviously, we're, we're, when we do these tests to test the voltage drop, the engine has to be cranking. Okay, all right. So a little bit on starter rebuilding. And I'm going to look at this quickly. Um, but the brushes are a normal wearing replacement part. So if we rebuild the starter, those need to be replaced. Sanding the commutator is going to remove normal corrosion where the brushes touch. So I can just take a piece of sandpaper and I'm going to go ahead and sand off this commutator right here, put new brushes, and sometimes that'll fix the starter. Um, the bushings or bearings wear from the spinning armature, and that can prevent shorting to the fuel coils. And sometimes you get a starter with high current draw and it's not spinning fast enough because the armature's bushings are worn. It's re leaning over and starting to rub against the fuel coils. And finally, the drive mechanism can be replaced when the starter spins but does not engage properly with the flywheel. So what we've got to understand is um, most people don't rebuild starter motors anymore. They just buy a rebuilt or they buy a new. But if I've got a, a big Caterpillar and or some big truck, it's a very, very expensive starter. I may want to think about rebuilding it. And there are people in the community that do that. Um, but we'd like to be able to take them apart. And sometimes we take apart and we can turn these, sand these connections in the starter relay and get the thing uh, going. And sometimes we can get a starter like this where we pull this plate off. And here's our battery terminal here. And on the other side over here is where the power goes into the starter. So there's a big copper disc. And then there's a contact on each side that we can replace. And we do that very successfully and have done it very much. So next, what will follow this is our demonstrations for starter motor testing that we just talked about.